Perfect. Thank you. I'll just share my screen now and I guess we can start. Yes. Sure. If you don't mind, Deanne, what I'm going to do right now, just uh, um, introduce you and myself to um, uh, those in attendance. Um, thank you for attending again tonight, uh, uh, folks. I really appreciate it. Um, Yan Lee is, is a third year law student um, at the law school um, at Western, uh, and she has um, a presentation for you tonight on public legal education with respect to separation agreements. Tonight will be, it will be general information. Um, we aren't going to get too in depth with things. Uh, if you have a question at the end, um, I can answer your question as best as possible. I am a, a lawyer at, at the Community Legal Services at Western. I'm review counsel and, and Yan Lee is one of my students. I can give general advice at the end of the um, presentation. I cannot give specific advice with respect to your specific scenario, uh, but I will do the best I can and I'll be open to questions. Um, so I'm going to leave it to Yan and she's going to do a great job. You're in good hands. Thank you for that, Greg. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Community Legal Services Information Session, this time on separation agreements. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabeg, Haudenosaunee, Lawampewak, and Chuangtung Nations on lands connected with the London Township and Sombra Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute toward revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. So as uh, Greg said, my name is Yen. I am a third year law student and a caseworker here at COS. I'm here today with uh, Greg, staff lawyer and review counsel here at COS as well. In this evening's presentation, I will pro provide some basic information on the separation agreements, what they are, what they do, uh, how they work, what they look like, etc. It will be approximately 20 minutes in length, followed by a Q&A session. One last thing before we start, please note that everything provided in this presentation is legal information only and not legal advice on any topic or any specific set of facts. So I will start with what a separation agreement is. It is a type of a domestic contract. Of domestic contract. The legal definition of it is found in the Federal Family Law Act, the FLA at section 54, which reads two persons who cohabited and are living separate and apart may enter into an agreement in which they agree on their respective rights and obligations, including ownership in or division of property, support obligations that include both child and spousal support, uh, the right to direct the education and moral training of their children, that includes uh, the religious, uh, religious education of their children as well, the right to decision-making responsibility or parenting time with respect to their children and any other matter in the settlement of their affairs. So as you, may, uh, as you can see, it can include a wide range of things. I have here some sample clauses that may be included in the separation agreement. In regards to parenting, one may put in restrictions on how often and in what ways each parent gets to contact the children or who will get the children passports, very specific things like that. In regards to privacy, you may put in something about the parties not insulting each other uh, or not going to each other's workplace or home. Other things you may find in the separation agreement include what religion the children will be raised in, which parent will the children stay with during school holidays or religious holidays, whether the children will be picked up or dropped off and at what time, et cetera, et cetera. So as you can see, it can, an agreement can really be as brief or as detailed as you want it to be. 
So just going back to the definition for a second, a key thing uh, to note here is that is the phrase living separate and apart. I like to touch a bit on that because it, it doesn't really mean what it looks like it means. So living separate and apart. The first thing to note here is that um, it doesn't have to be a divorce. It applies to cohabiting couples, people in common law relationships as well. The second thing to note and the more important one is that despite what it may sound like, physical separation is not necessary. Two people who uh, two people do not need to live in two different homes in order to be considered separate and apart. Instead, it's the intent to separate, the intention to live separate and apart that matters. This is why we have the legal concept of living separate and apart under the same roof. Two people can be living in the same house, apartment, or condo, and they may still be considered separate and apart. Courts will instead look into specific details of their everyday life to determine whether they're separated. They'll look at, for example, if the people are sleeping separately in different rooms, whether intimate or sexual activities have stopped, how much and how often they communicate is a noticeably less compared to before, uh, whether they stopped performing domestic services for each other, like do they do their laundries and buy their groceries separately? Do they split the bill on utilities and rent? Uh, maybe one of them used to cook for both of them, but now they each cook for themselves. Whether they eat separately, and lastly, whether they've stopped acting like a couple in front of others, like their family and friends. Like, do they do they stop going to social functions together as a family unit? Uh, it's important to note that this is not an exhaustive list. This is just the factors that are usually the most telling nor is any of these absolute. For example, just because two people still eat at the same time, at the same table, it doesn't mean they can't be separate and apart. Maybe they just happen to eat at the same time and there's only one dining table in the house. Or they might, parents, separate parents might go to social events together for the sake of their children. That doesn't, that doesn't mean they're not separated. The main point is, it's the intention and not any physical demonstrations of separation that determines whether two people have been living separate and apart. So if two people are living separate and apart, they may enter into a separation agreement. Before doing that, in most cases, the party should obtain independent legal advice. What that is, it's legal advice given by a lawyer. It's usually not a good idea to get legal advice from someone who's not a lawyer but just, not just any lawyer in this case, uh, independent legal advice is legal advice given by a lawyer who doesn't have a conflict of interest and who is also not associated with any party involved in the conflict, in this case, the separation. Independent legal advice helps to make sure that both parties understand the implications of whatever agreement they're entering into, so neither side is being misled or taken advantage of by the other. It also clarify any issues you don't understand and help you avoid common mistakes. In most cases, a certificate of independent legal advice is required for parties entering into a separation agreement. In terms of formalities, uh, a valid domestic contract must be written. It must then be signed by both parties and also witnessed. Both parties must also provide financial disclosure to the other. That is, they must disclose any significant assets, debt, and liabilities that exist at the time the contract was made. If a party fails to do so, the court may set aside the contract or a provision in it. And lastly, as it's a contract, it must be entered into freely and voluntarily with no duress or coercion involved. If one party is forced into signing a domestic contract or if they show that they didn't understand the nature or the consequence of it, say if they're tricked or pressured into signing it in a hurry so they didn't get time to read it over or really consider what it meant, the contract can be set aside by the court. Something that happens a lot is parties signing a separation agreement in a hurry for financial purposes. Like if they want to sell the house or something, they might want to divide their properties and settle any matters in that regard fast. That pressure for speed can be considered duress in certain circumstances. So don't rush it. Take the time to draft it carefully because 
a domestic contract that's put together carelessly can lead can potentially lead to a lot of problems down the road. So when drafting the agreement, it's important to don't just grab any template from Google. There are instances of people getting templates from online without knowing that they're from other jurisdictions like American ones, and they just aren't suitable. It's best to go to a family lawyer and have them do it for you. Once an agreement is drafted, it needs to be filed with a court form. In this case, Form 26B, Affidavit for Filing Domestic Contract with Court. It can be found on the Ontario Court Services website at ontariocourtforms.on.ca under Family Law Rules Forms. Also, there is a compilation of standard clauses found in family law, which is very helpful for people drafting domestic contracts without the help of a lawyer. A few final things of note, a separation agreement, which is a domestic contract, is enforceable in court, provided that all the requirements and formalities are met. Lastly, uh, many people at separation choose to go to mediation, where a mediator tries to help the parties resolve conflict and come to a mutual understanding. After the mediation, the mediator will write up what's called a memorandum of understanding which outlines the agreements that the parties arrived at during the mediation process. It's important to note that that memorandum of understanding is not a valid domestic contract, so it's not enforceable in court. A lot of people think they are, but they're not. So that's just something to keep in mind. And now I will briefly go through the drafting process of a separation agreement, show how it works and what it looks like. Give me one moment. So we have this handy software called DivorceMate. And this. So this would be a very like standard form separation agreement. In the very beginning, you have you will have the name of the parties, names of the parties, the date, and the names of names and signatures of the witnesses. And here are all the thing, all the things you can put, you can potentially put in a contract. At the outset, you generally have definitions of term, like legal terminology or just terminologies in general, and also every, uh, abbreviations, what they mean. Then you, you would have the background information of the parties, normally like when they married, when they separated, and when they got divorced, if applicable, birth date, age, any children involved, and any other information depending on the particular circumstances of the case. And in almost all domestic contracts, you would have this respect and privacy clause. This doesn't mean that the parties are in high conflict or even that they don't get along. It's put their just in case, it's kind of like a preventative measure, if you will. If children are involved, which they are in this hypothetical case I made up, there's, there will be a section, hopefully, on parenting. Uh, this is where the parents lay out who will get to decide what when it comes to the children. It's important to note that decision-making used to be called custody, and parenting time used to be called access. But they mean they mean the same thing, just the new terms. So as you can see here, there is a, a variety of decision making styles, and a, there's a lot of ways that parents may choose to do this. They may do uh, joint decision making, which says they will make important decisions together. That's what it looks like. So decision making means that one parent gets to make all important decisions and the other parent doesn't have a say. So decision-making in consultation with the other means while one parent has final say in all decisions, they must first consult the other parent. You may also specify that the decision-making parent needs to notify the other parent in writing or an X amount of days in advance. 
bifurcated decision making means that one parent will have sole decision making for certain things and the other one will have sole decision making for other things. For example, one may have a final say in health, health matters and the other one in religion and education. Parenting time is the schedule that says when parents get to have the children in their care and for how long. There's a variety of default schedules to suit different needs. An important thing here is the right of first refusal, which basically means that the parties agree that if, a, if one party can't take care of the children when it's their turn to do so, they will first offer the other party the chance to take care of the children before asking a third party, such as uh, the grandparent or a daycare. Education is another really big thing. You can specify who gets to go to parent-teacher conferences, who gets to go on field trips, et cetera, et cetera. Information from third parties just means that both parents are entitled to be informed and they can have access to information about the children given by people like teachers, doctors, dentists, counselors, et cetera. So they're both entitled to information related to the children from third parties. Travel is a common one as well. Uh, usually one parent would want to know when the other parent decides to take the kids on the trip. You may require the traveling parent to get a notarized uh, authorization before they can take the children away. You can also specify which parent will get the children passports. Uh, Child support is a very big thing in separation agreements involving children, but I won't go into it. My fellow caseworker Liz Cinco did a very detailed and informative presentation on child support and it's available both on our website and our YouTube channel. And if you're interested, please check that out. Dispute resolution outlines um, how the parties will resolve any issues or conflict that could arise. And please note here that if you put in the agreement that the part you say the parties have to do mediation or no negotiation before before some uh, before something else, then you have to do it. People also specify for medical and dental benefits. People also specify who will uh, be responsible for the children's insurance benefits. And finally. Uh, we will not go to spousal support or property because we as COS do not uh, deal in such areas. In the end, you will have the general terms. Uh, the parties will acknowledge that this is a domestic contract and that this domestic contract prevails over all other matters dealt under the Family Law Act. They will specify that It will specify that the laws of Ontario apply to the agreement, and also that this agreement is binding. And should one should one party uh, die, then this agreement will still be binding on their heirs and executors, uh, executors and uh, their estate. Amendments is another very important thing. Uh, any you should specify that any amendments to the original agreement must, just like the agreement itself, be written, signed, and witnessed. Execution of other documents means that if there's a provision in this, in this agreement that requires the signing of another document, the parties must sign that document to make this agreement effective. And finally, you would attach for you would this is where you uh, uh, you would attach under schedules you would attach the certificate of independent legal advice. That's what it looks like. And should a party decide to waive independent legal advice, then you would put a waiver there as an as an attached schedule to the agreement. 
So that is the drafting process of what a standard uh, separation agreement would look like. In real life, they're in practice, they are much longer and much more, usually much longer and much more complicated than these, but than this, but these are the most basic terms that you would find in almost every single separation agreement involving children. So that concludes my portion of the presentation. And now we'll open the floor up to questions. Thank you, Ian. Uh, very good job. Uh, before we, we take some questions, a couple of things that I, I just want to add. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. One, um, at, at CLS, um, like Ian said, we, we don't do uh, property issues. Um, it, it, and that deals with division of assets, uh, you know, when parties uh, perhaps own a home together or um, they have vehicles and so forth. Um, and at CLS, we don't do that. And primarily uh, because we deal with uh, uh, lower income individuals who don't have those assets. Uh, we are funded by legal aid. Uh, so we, we uh, provide assistance to uh, lower income individuals and we don't get into property. Um, with respect to spousal support, um, we will be doing another presentation on that, a separate one. So I, I don't want Yan uh, to go uh, too in depth to that tonight, uh, but it is something that, that we do um, cover at CLS. Um, I, I, I just see a couple of uh, uh, questions coming in the chat. And I will check those out as well um, uh, once I'm done rambling here. The, um, it's so important, folks, to make sure, even if you, know, you cannot afford a lawyer, um, you can do what you can call the lawyer uh, referral service. Um, and that will give you uh, 30 minutes of free independent legal advice, independent legal advice or ILA, as it's called, um, is essentially a half hour or, or an hour of uh, a lawyer's advice, independent legal advice on, on whatever you present to them that day. I think at the very least, I, I know lawyers are expensive, but believe me, um, but to to at least spend an hour, if you and your former spouse have, have drafted some kind of what we call a kitchen table agreement, where it's just the two of you and you've wrote something out, I, I cannot encourage you enough to at least take it to a lawyer for an hour. Um, you can call uh, lawyers office, offices in the area um, and ask for independent legal advice. Um, some don't. Uh, uh, provide that. Some will, will ask for a retainer, and, and that's not uncommon and that's not unusual. Um, but if, you, if you're out there and, and, and you don't have a lot of money, you can call private lawyers and ask for independent legal advice. I, I think at the very least, um, it, you, the public should, should be making sure that the agreements that they uh, are drafting are at least um, being looked at by uh, a legal professional. Um, there are, in my experience in practicing, um, there, there have been too many horror stories that I've seen where um, separation agreements are over, overturned in court, uh, perhaps because they haven't been witnessed properly, perhaps because neither party got uh, independent legal advice, um, or uh, as Yan talked about, Perhaps they didn't uh, exchange financial disclosure. Um, it's so important if there's one thing or if there are a couple of things that you need to take away from today is if you're gonna do a separation agreement, it should be witnessed uh, by two separate individuals. You both should have independent legal advice if at all possible. You should be exchanging if there are, are financial issues involved you should be exchanging um, sworn financial statements right? and you can um, obtain that from the Ontario Court Forms website. 
just as similarly, you can uh, obtain the standard clauses in family law matters that uh, uh, Yan was talking about uh, in her presentation. You, unfortunately, um, the program that Yan, uh, yes, I, I see your hand, uh, Ahethan, thank you, uh, but I, I will continue, I'll, I'll catch you. The, um, the, we want to make sure that the public are taking the, the proper steps to, to uh, ensure that the, their separation agreements won't be overturned. Um, and, and again, I'm seeing that, that too often. Uh, so I can't, like I said, I cannot stress that enough. Uh, I will uh, go to the first question I see in the chat here. Um, Okay, so what if the parties agree to forego financial disclosure and agree to child support above the law guideline amounts? Okay. So that, uh, good question. So what I, what I say to my clients and what I say to the students is at the very least, um, if you do a separation agreement, and the guideline amount is not being uh, paid uh, for the children uh, in the child support amount, the court has the discretion to overturn that, no matter what. You both could have independent legal advice. You both could um, exchange financial, financial disclosure. Even if you did that, um, the court would still overturn uh, any child support agreement that they didn't think was appropriate in accordance with the guidelines. Now, you're suggesting uh, in this particular circumstance that to pay above the guideline amount. Well, I can't see the, the court having an issue with that um, generally, right? Uh, like I said in the beginning, I, I can only give general advice and, and I can't hear uh, more information on the specifics of it. Uh, but if, if if the if your former spouse is paying more than the guideline amount for child support, I can't imagine why that would be an issue. Um, I I would be concerned uh, if the guideline amount wasn't being payable or wasn't being paid, and then that's where financial disclosure is going to be an issue. But if you don't do financial disclosure and uh, child support being paid over the guideline amount, then, then you should be fine. But I mean, my refrain will forever be um, you, when parties separate, they should be doing sworn financial statements and they should be, be at least disclosing uh, their last three years tax returns and their, and their uh, most recent pay stub. Uh, the rules require that. But I understand that, you know, it, like the scenario that Yan um, brought up in her presentation, I, I know that. Um, separating parties, you know, they want closure, they want to move on, uh, and especially they want to do that if they want to get a new home. But to, to hurry up and, and, and rush that process to, to, get a, uh, to get a mortgage, you may, I mean, you may be really causing some long-term pain there. Um, I, 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 and I know I, I struggled lots with my clients on that particular issue, um, but I've also seen how it can end up, you know, when, when things go sideways in the future. Um, so though, I, if nothing else from tonight, that's what you should be taking away. Independent legal advice, financial disclosure, give yourself time, witness, okay? Um, I'm going to go to the next question. Hopefully, I hopefully I answered that. Uh, but thank you. That was a good question. Um, I don't know. So, I I want to to let you guys know that we're partnering tonight with the Rights and Responsibility Awareness Institute, uh, and uh, Hetham Karki, who is uh, um, assisting us with that, he just uh, popped up on the screen there. In the chat, he has, he has uh, included a, a uh, feedback form uh, that you can fill out and just give us some uh, general feedback on, on 
or what you thought of tonight. Um, so we, we would appreciate you doing that. Um, I saw um, Hepham close his video, so I'm sure that's what he wanted to say. Well, thank you, Greg, for that. Thank you, Jan, for that very informative uh, presentation. I actually have a question. Okay. Would the family uh, law in Canada consider a separation agreement that being drafted in a different jurisdiction? You know, because many of us are immigrants, so sometimes we could draft something in our home countries, then we move to Canada and then the separation happened. So would the Canadian legal system consider such an agreement? Uh, yeah, good question. Thank, uh, good question, thank you. Um, we've actually had a, a, a couple of experiences on that, that uh, a very point um, at CLS. Um, so, that, so that's a good question. The, the contract, the separation contract, whatever it may be called, um, that may be done in another jurisdiction, another country, um, so long as it, it conforms with the, um, the general uh, contract rules and, and the general family law rules in Canada and in Ontario, then it will be respected. The, um, what we have, have noticed in a couple of the cases that we've had um, is that so long as, as, for example, if there is a, a, some kind of dowry that is included in a, in a separation agreement, it, if that can be uh, uh, proven to be agreed upon a, and um, a considered in a fair and, and appropriate manner, that, that will be uh, carried into Canada and Ontario as well. Um, so, so that's how we look at it. We look at it from our perspective, um, but, the, the contract, the basic contract rules aren't, at least in my experience, that different. So um, we haven't had too much difficulty in, in making sure that those contracts are valid in Ontario. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay, so we'll look at the next question here. Uh, my husband and I separated in November 2021. I have a trailer that's in my husband's name. Does he have the right to sell it or is it an equal split? So at CLS, unfortunately, um, we don't deal with property issues. Um, so I, I can't answer that particular question. Um, I, I would encourage you to uh, contact a lawyer referral service. Um, and, and that will allow you to have at least a half hour free uh, legal advice from a lawyer. And then the lawyer will hopefully direct you to an available lawyer in your region that uh, could assist you. Um, I, I, do, I do want to give you specific advice on that particular question, but I, I unfortunately I can't, but, but thank you for asking it. Okay. Um, what is the difference between separation and divorce? What are the pros and cons slash reasons someone may go through with a separate separation agreement over a divorce? Um, yeah, and I don't know if you want to you want to handle that question just with respect to dif the difference between a separation and a divorce. Sure. Yeah, I can certainly try. <laughs> uh, well, separate, divorce only applies to married couples that were married under the Divorce Act. The, yeah, the Divorce Act. Uh, separation, on the other hand, applies to common law couples and just couples that are cohabit they're they're cohabiting but not married, essentially. Right. Yeah. So yeah. The yeah. Key difference. Yeah. Thank you, Ian. So, any uh, any couple that married or not. Um, if they are, are residing together, at least in a common law relationship, um, you know, whether that is they live together for longer than a year in, in some kind of uh, conjugal relationship, or they have a child together um, and they live together. If they have such a relationship and they decide to 
to part ways and they've been living separate and apart with no reasonable expectation of, of getting back together, of reconciling, that's separation. That there's no magic to it. Nobody has to say you're, do, you're separated. If you're living separate and apart uh, with no um, reasonable prospect of getting back together, that, that is a separation. And, and I'm not sure if you were here um, in the beginning, which, which I know, I think you said in your question, um, you could even be living under the same roof and living separate and apart. Perhaps you're not having a sexual relationship anymore. Perhaps you're not sleeping in the same bed. Um, it's all about the intention. And, and, and frankly, you could have one spouse, and which is often the case, one spouse who, who knows it's over and the other that doesn't. Um, and, and sometimes the separation date could be um, a contested issue, but more often than not, it's not. Um, so for purposes of, of knowing when you're separated, it's when you're living separate and apart without a reasonable prospect of getting back together. The, what are the pros and cons slash reasons someone may go through a separation agreement over a divorce? I, in my experience, with my clients, they want a divorce primarily for two reasons. One, they want to, they want closure. They want it to be done, they want to move on. And that, that is a compelling reason. I, I, I mean, I, uh, I, I can understand that. Um, you know, it's, it's a clean break, so to speak. Um, but primarily, in, in my experience, the, the main reason to get divorced is so you can remarry. Um, you can't get remarried without having a certificate of, uh, d of divorce in your possession. So that, that primarily um, is a pro uh, that I've seen. One, closure, and two, so you can remarry. Um, I've, had, I've had clients or I've, I've had clients who, you know, five years ago, they got their separation and they still, they don't have a divorce. Um, so... The pros and cons, I, I, that may be a personal thing. Um, but there, the, you, the key is, because I get this a lot uh, from, from the public, is you don't have to be divorced to be separated. Okay. We keep moving down here. Okay. Okay. So... I see, um, Nadja, I, I want to make sure I'm saying your name uh, correctly. We followed up. The difficulty is the spouse refusing to provide financial disclosure and they would otherwise hold up the ability to come to the agreement. Sometimes in these scenarios, uh, folks, uh, it is common. Um, if a fine... I mean, in all separation agreements, in, in almost all separation agreements, financial disclosure is a must. And if, if, if the other party is not, is refusing to provide financial disclosure, unfortunately, the next step is, is to contact a lawyer. Um, because the moment you, if you, you commence an application to court, you know, for decision-making, parenting time, financial information, once you do so, the other party, the person who is refusing to provide financial disclosure, they are, are mandated by the law to provide that. And, and the court is not going to let that party proceed essentially on anything uh, that they want until that information is provided. Um, so unfortunately, Nadja, the, the, uh, the, the resolution may be having to go to court. Um, but I encourage you to speak to um, uh, your own lawyer uh, to see if that, that is a, an appropriate thing to do. The oh, sorry, I just saw your 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 um, your additional uh, message saying it's been three years since separation. My advice, my general advice, would remain the same on that point. Yes, I, I, Jan, Ed, Jan Edwards. Yeah, that's a toughie. Um, and, and that is, that is the, 
the very issue that Ian and I are talking about. Um, if your uh, former spouse won't get ILA and sign the agreement, I, the, in my experience, generally, again, uh, like the previous general advice, Perhaps speaking to a lawyer and talking about going to court is going to, to force that issue. Uh, because in my experience, a lending institution is not going to, to provide any financing without either a separation and a partial separation agreement, partial domestic contract, um, or an order, a court order that says, here's what everybody's obligations are. Because the, the worry from the lending institution is, if I don't have a contract before me, I don't know if you're going to have a spousal support obligation. I don't know if you're going to have a child support obligation. I don't know if you're going to have to pay uh, to equalize the family assets. So I don't know if you're going to be able to afford this mortgage if I give it to you. Um, and I, I find myself getting into property issues. But that generally, that is, uh, that's the dilemma for you, right? I, I would encourage you to, to get independent legal advice um, a, and that lawyer can suggest what your next step is. Um, but it is very unfortunately uh, common that you, um, clients will find themselves in the standstill that uh, you and the previous uh, a question uh, questioner are in. Okay, filing of taxes 2021 personal. Oop. Okay, where are we? Okay, filing, sorry. Filing of taxes 2021 personal income tax. Do couples file separate or together, but we are not legally separated? Well, I can't, I can't tell you how to file your taxes. Um, all I can say is you are separated when you're living separate and apart with a reasonable prospect of getting back together. So if you're living under the same roof, again, you can still be living separate and apart. Um, but again, that, it, that could be a very personal thought of your own. So whoever is your tax preparer, I, I would speak to them about that. Yeah, your second question, um, sorry, I think maybe Ava Icorn. Um, your second question is very complex. Um, I, I, I will say there, there just no way, unfortunately, that I could, could not shell it for you. Um, and especially there are complex uh, property issues. So I would encourage you to to get independent legal advice, maybe an hour, or even call the lawyer referral service for an hour, a uh, half hour free uh, legal advice, um, because those are uh, some complex issues. And um, the amount of debt um, that perhaps he is responsible for is something that you should um, yell loud and clear to your uh, lawyer that it gives you independent legal advice. Oh, uh, so I, I, I'm sure you you uh, all have seen in the chat, and if you've not, uh, Hetham just um, said that there is a workshop through RRAI on March 16th about taxes. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out as well. I don't see any other, uh, oh, here we go. Um, so if we do a template contract and get a lawyer to help us and we both sign this legitimate in the eyes of the law, we can fill out what we agree upon as support, even if, even if it is not calculated by a lawyer. Okay. So you can definitely do, so Yan in her, her presentation said, you know, we, we caution and discourage you from using online templates. And, and, and that would still be my, my general advice. But if you're going to take that template to a lawyer, I feel much more uh, comforted uh, for the public if that's their plan. 
my my concern is if it's a, a, an online template and and you both sign it, nobody witnesses it, and you you act as though it's binding. That that is that's a, a risky risky move. Um, if you do, and I understand it, uh, you know lawyers are are expensive, uh, and those online templates are there. If you if you see them, you can use them as a framework. Um, and then that helps. I, I mean, I always like it when when clients come to me with a template because it's a framework. It's already there. They don't have to say it to me and and uh, I start fresh. So I, if you're going to use it in that manner, uh, go for it. Um, but if you use it as a um, a mechanism just between the two of you and then the, you're going to act as though it's binding, uh, I would be concerned. Um, what I what I have experienced in my practice is when a lawyer when when a client comes to me with a template, I start from scratch anyway. Like I mean, I use the terms that are in place, but I will my my format will be different. Uh, the the terms may be different because they may not be the terms that are are used in Ontario court family law. Um, so that may may happen when you say um, if we do a template contract and get a lawyer to help us, um, they they are are more than likely going to say, well, that's good, but I'm going to do my own thing, and I I mean I, I'm going to use the information you have, but I'm going to do um, I'm going to do it the right way according to them. Um, so I'd be prepared for that. What I would also say is a lawyer is not going to represent both of you on a separation uh, agreement. That's a, a conflict of interest uh, because you two, although you may be amicable, have conflicting interests by virtue that you're now separated. Um, so as a lawyer, I can't do a joint uh, retainer and say, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, Mr. and Mr. Smith, whatever. I can't represent both of you. I can represent one of you. I can do the contract. And then the other party needs to go uh, and get independent legal advice from their own separate lawyer. Um, so generally, that's what I would, I would advise you to do, Jen, is one of you needs to decide who's going to be um, taking the bulk of the agreement to the lawyer. They're going to be drafting it. And then the other party needs to... Um, be getting independent legal advice. Um, with respect to your second question, we can fill out what we agree upon as support, even if it is not calculated by a lawyer. So if you mean child support, I would go back to what I said earlier in that you can agree on all kinds of things with respect to child support. If there is ever a disagreement, um, and the table amount is being asked to be paid, the court is going to order it. The child support uh, is the right of the child. You can ask my students. They are completely annoyed by me saying that over and over again. But child support is the right of the child, is the right of the children. Uh, so if you agree on something uh, that is not in accordance with the guidelines, just know that that's not binding on the court. If it ever gets contested, uh, it, it will be overturned uh, unless you have some other kind of arrangement that ensures uh, to the court that the children are being looked after financially. Um, I am seeing so many divorces, uncontested divorces, these days get overturned by the court because they don't have appropriate uh, terms in place for child support. Um, so for those of you out there that may be looking to do an uncontested divorce, make sure that uh, your child support uh, obligations are in place or, it, or at least explained as to why child support is not being paid. Um, but it, like, I, I just can't stress it enough that court will, without thinking, overturn a child support agreement that is not in uh, the ch child's best interests.
Any more questions? Those were great questions, guys. Uh, really appreciate it. Just give you uh, 30 seconds or so. Let's see if any hands go up. I saw a couple of people who were trying to connect the entire time. I yeah, apologize, but remember, uh, we're recording this and, and it will be available uh, on our YouTube page and, and on our website. Okay. Yeah, and is there anything you wanted to add? No, I think that's good. Okay. All right, folks, I appreciate you coming out tonight. Uh, it looked, we had a great uh, uh, turnout. I, I, I'm glad you guys came. Um, we're, we're, we're hopefully, well, not hopefully, we're doing more of these um, and we will send out the blast and, and you guys can attend those as well. Okay. Thanks, folks. Have a good night.